Okay. Um, my name is Ilana. Um, this is a joint talk together with Shua. Um, our talk is going to be about real-time Linux and safety critical systems. And we, call, we decided to call it the potential and the challenge, challenges because I think um, even the title has some terms which people may look at it at first glance. Safety critical together with real-time Linux. Maybe it should be uh, proprietary RTOS. So um, we are looking at it from the angle of the potential, the power of Linux, and how we deal with the challenges which they present. A little bit closer. Closer to the mic. Okay, you hear me? It's okay? Okay. Um, Shua from the Linux Foundation, she'll take over. She will speak in the second half of this talk about her work in this area. Okay, so um, I'll go a little quickly because it's a little short. As we are all aware, there are challenges which um, Linux presents um, for safety critical systems. And um, we don't have, you know, bulletproof solutions, but we would like to present some of the work which we have been doing and how we, we are facing those challenges and how we expect to be able to deal with them. Part of this is, oops, well that, okay, um, is, grew out of work that's in the ELISA project, which is trying to enable Linux in safety critical applications, a project also of the Linux Foundation. So, to get started, what are we trying to achieve? So the first and, and most important thing is that we, would um, we are trying to investigate the very, very rich set of Linux features which are provided um, by real-time Linux with the obvious understanding that nobody is going to apply every single one of those features in any single system. But because of the rich set of features which is available, in any particular system, we can do a careful analysis the same way if we put aside, for example, safety critical um, needs. When you want to design a real-time system, you have to very, very carefully define your real-time requirements. You have to really understand very well your use case, your architecture. You understand the requirements for latency, for um, determinism, et cetera, et cetera and you look into the set of features, what's supported, and you decide how you architect your system, how you design it, how you implement it, how you test it, to ensure that your real-time requirements are going to be met. And similarly, we do the same thing for the safety critical features. You have to do a very careful analysis. What are your safety requirements? Not every bit of data is safety critical. Not every process or task or thread is going to be safety critical, there are different levels of safety criticality, and you have to de decide when you design, design your architecture what exactly is your focus, what are your requirements, and then you do the same sort of process you have to investigate. You look into the set of features which are available, and you design your system so that your requirements should be met, and then at the end of the day you have to do a lot, a lot of testing, as anybody knows in real-time systems. You have to do a lot of testing to ensure as much as possible that those requirements are met. Okay, so that's basically what we are trying to do now. We are investigating the various features and trying to come up, and this is ongoing work, with guidelines for when one option may be more reasonable than others, and how we can put together the different features in ways which can support specific requirements. Okay, so that's the goal of this work. What um, is not going to be in this work, um, I don't think when people develop real-time systems they expect there's going to be some magic wand that you wave over the man pages, I don't know, whatever, and then you have automatically a real-time system that does anything real. But I think sometimes in, for safety critical, system, there's some kind of idea that um, my magic things will be safe, but it's, it's really basically the same process, good engineering, um, good system design, and, and a lot of testing to make sure that your system meets those requirements. So we just make it clear because this is something that we've been repeatedly asked in ELISA if we're going to give an off-the-shelf kernel release which is going to be safe. Uh, it, that's something like that won't 
doesn't exist, and I don't think um, anybody who's realistic about any engineering work should have such um, expectations. Um, basically, we have features. You have to use them in a sensible, reasonable, and effective way and demonstrate by testing that your requirements are met and um, that you do have um, a system which is safe and meets your real-time requirements as well. Okay, so, oops. Okay, so what is our methodology? We basically, you have to know very well, understand your use case. You have to understand your expected workload because those details I will define how you define your architecture, your first your requirements, then your architecture, implement and test it. Okay, and what I found absolutely amazing, I mean it's only pretty recently that I started going to this area in, in my work, you know, in designing systems. There's so much that Linux offers that I, I put aside, you know, the, the safety um, attitude for in the beginning that you have to keep things down to a minimum. And I said, let's look at what's available, that whole huge set of features. And then we, just, we zoom in and focus on what's absolutely relevant and what can really support what we need in our um, particular um, use case. Okay, and then you have to validate, and this is very important to confirm that your design actually meets those requirements, both real time and safety. And then test, test, and I could have written test, test forever, because, I mean, that should be pretty clear that um, testing is going to be very important to prove that um, not only the real time requirements are met, but also that the safety critical requirements are met. Okay, and this is something which works. So I'm not looking at this from an angle of safety qualification or anything like that. But from experience, when a system is well designed in this way, it comes with clear requirements. Um, the features which are chosen to be integrated and, and are configured and defined in a, an appropriate way that it, you can demonstrate that they satisfy the relevant um, safety and real-time requirements, you're halfway there already for also acceptance for safety qualification, okay? So, and, and that's really the point here, that good engineering brings you very far, and that could be if you're using Linux or an RTOS, and I would say just the opposite is also true. <laughs> Bad engineering, you won't have a safe system, you won't have a system which um, meets real-time requirements, so it, it, it all revolves around that. Okay, now I don't have much time, I mean, there's a lot of um, basic material here, and. The work here that um, I've been doing is trying to investigate these features and, and to read them now in a new way, thinking of them in terms of not only how do these features help us to meet um, real-time requirements, but how they can help us to meet safety requirements. So, I mean, this is, I think, I mean, this is sort of basic. Um, if anybody works with a real-time system, that you could, yeah, there are different scheduling policies. I'll just very briefly explain for anybody who doesn't come with that background. And basically what you do in a real-time system, you can define priorities um, to assign to your different tasks. And the way you define those priorities, uh, uh, a real-time um, task which has very strict um, real-time requirements should have the highest priority possible. So again, how you assign those priorities, that goes back to the architecture. You have to understand what are all the tasks you are working with. You have to allocate the priorities accordingly. And similarly, those priorities also have implications on the um, safety requirements as well. Okay? So again, we're just taking the same basic real-time guidelines and now looking them in the light of how they impact safety requirements as well. Okay, memory allocations, as a general rule, um, dynamic allocations are considered less safe. So we try as much as possible what we can to allocate, um, you know, compile time, or if we necessarily can allocate a, a static pool from which we do dynamic allocations, but only within that protected and safe static pool. In any case, that also has implications for real-time design because um, any 
dynamic allocation has a tendency, and again, you know, it's, you can just give, those are rules of thumb, which again have to be tested and verified in specific use cases. But in the general rule, dynamic allocations tend to um, impact, okay, your real-time um, determinism and latency, et cetera, and therefore, we try to avoid it as much as possible. So that's a common goal. And we have to understand how in a particular architecture, a particular system, how we actually apply that. Okay, and there are other features you can try to, you can make sure, see if you can as much as possible to resolve symbols already at system startup. And you can also lock it, pages in memory after allocation. Again, when that's relevant and possible, it's a good thing to do because that will help also for memory safety and um, for um, meeting the real-time requirements, okay? Why isn't it going down? Okay, resource managements, we have CPU sets, we can define, um, um, use that to define the different features which Linux supports to define separation architecture. In the world of safety, there's this, uh, I think this is uh, um, focused on automotive safety where I come from. There's a concept called freedom from interference, which basically means you need a, uh, your architecture has to be partitioned and in a way and designed in such a way that one software co component provably cannot um, impact the execution of another software component. Okay, so that, there are plenty of basic tools in features of Linux which support um, freedom from interference. And again, we have to look at all these type of, of features from the, with an eye on, on meeting real-time requirements as well. We can define um, CPU sets so that we isolate CPUs if we want to um, have uh, a CPU, let's say, which is dedicated to a particularly sensitive real-time real workload, et cetera, we can also set affinity masks. All these features, again, are offered. We can use them. Once we understand what our real-time requirements are, what our safety requirements are, we can use them in, a, in an appropriate way and um, to, to meet those requirements, okay? Um, I don't have much time, so I'm just gonna go quickly go over these um, real-time workloads. There are features which help to ensure jitter-free CPUs. Jitter can also be a problem for safety. And again, these same features can be used and are used. I mean, I know we're using them to, to support safety requirements as well on systems. Okay, clock inter interrupts, timing issues, um, et cetera, all these different features. Um, Linux helps us with the TSC is something which is specific for Intel and it's not always relevant, it's not always, it's not really portable, but again, it's a feature which exists, which has its use cases and there are more generic features for timing, again, to help support power management, system tuning, different safety nets which exist, which can be removed if we want to, some of them, um, how we handle RT throttling, um, and in Shua's work, she's going to give some examples, more specific examples of some newer use cases. Um, here, for example, and I think I'll finish about a, two minutes because I have to hand over to Shua already, but um, for example, the first recommendation, normally in real-time systems, as a general rule, again, to every rule there is an exception, but um, we would prefer to disable soft lockup and other lockup detectors. However, in safety critical systems, these are features which we may actually need them to support the system safety. So we have to balance the different requirements and decide what is the most relevant thing to do. Another thing which I found, hardware errors which are um, self-corrected by hardware normally should be ignored. And especially in the automotive domain, we have, I'm not gonna get to it, but there's a, we have a slide on, on handling um, 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 SMIs, um, what I have found that we have even, sometimes the hardware itself has features which support um, how we handle and how we, um, um, 
how we, let's, okay, just um, to, to investigate the different type of SMIs, and to, they're well defined, and to be able to how we handle them. And again, if we work together with the hardware and the Linux features, we can find good solutions for problems which may be very, very difficult to resolve otherwise. Okay? So, um, this is what I told you before about this. Okay, this is what I said about combined with hardware features may be found in automotive grade components to, to help us to actually um, define a, a correct architecture to manage properly SMIs, which may be otherwise a very, very difficult problem. Okay, so priority version, debug tricks, and some kernel configurations. In short, we have a lot of features, and all these features can be used judiciously. They should be seen as assets, which can help us to um, support our safety and real-time requirements. Designing a good system, testing it well, um, is the best assurance that we can give for a good system. Okay, um, Shua, we'll take over now. Okay. Okay, um, so Yelena talked about um, how, what we are scope and what we're trying to do here. And I have uh, another goal we have is be able to put together guidelines for system integrators to uh, how they can understand the system, understand the platform, understand the workload w with um, on top of running on top of preempt RD kernel. So um, here is the repository where we have, kernel repository where we have the development branch of Linux preempt RT kernel. So what uh, my goal has been to get the preempt RT kernel uh, development branch, latest uh, one, and then set it up to run preempt RT, um, enable preempt RT option so that you get Pre, you're actually running the preempt RT kernel. And then um, there's some guidelines on disabling RT group SCAD because for the workload I'm using, I have to disable that so, to be able to set uh, tweak um, priorities on the threads. So you will see that I'm playing with these two, preempt RT kernel um, uh, development branch, and then RT tests repository. I'm using RT tests as a workload to run, um, to evaluate, and to set up, gu develop guidelines for uh, system integrators so that they can do, do the same thing, take the preempt RT kernel, and put their workload on top, and then follow the same kind of things that I have done here to evaluate how their workload is behaving on the platform they understand, hardware platform I mean hardware and firmware, and then you have the preempt RT kernel in the middle, and then they can put their workload that they should know more about, and then if they want to understand how that workload is behaving on this RT, preempt RT kernel. So I have, we have, I have chosen two tests, cyclic test and deadline test, and cyclic deadline test. Those are the ones. And you will see that I will be um, running these with and without a uh, lot of load. In some cases, I have run these with six kernel compiles happening. That means the disk and I.O. and memory is under pressure. And then how does real time work in, the, in those cases? So the numbers, the numbers I focus on is a missed you, missed by number right there, you see? So that is important to me, because I want to see how a deadline uh, misses. Is my workload missing deadlines? And then this is a quick uh, usage on deadline test. And then here you see on this slide, I run it on a preempt RT kernel, and then I take the same workload and run it on a vanilla kernel without preempt RT enable. So you will see what I'm looking for is missed deadlines. So are, is my workload missing deadlines? So that's an indication for me that I have to go look at why, I'm, why the workload is missing deadlines. So let's go one further, and you'll see um, more. The previous one is the run on a preempt RT kernel, and you'll see the run on vanilla kernel. So vanilla kernel, I mean, is that I don't have preempt RT enabled at all. 
So this is the main line, by the way, from Linus's uh, main, top of the line. Main, main, I, I'm comparing main line with equivalent um, RT, because RT development tree, they keep uh, merging up, so you will see that. Um, so um, cyclic deadline, you want to run um, a one hour stress test. You can't just run it once, like 10 minutes, and figure out what's going on. So you want to run it at least one hour or maybe longer, depending on what your workload behavior is. And then, uh, so you, you will be comparing those two. So the goal here is you, you're un trying to understand your system with um, your hardware, firmware, and then preempt RT kernel running. On top of that, you have your workload. You're looking for a um, couple of things here. Um, you're measuring latency. And then you're also looking for looking for um, any operating system noise. And I have tools here that can tell you that. And then also you're looking for hardware noise. If you enable hardware noise um, tracer in the kernel configuration option, there are two OS noise tracer and a hardware noise tracer. You can enable that when you build those kernel configuration and build the kernel. And then you can, and you can look at um, the, how your system is behaving. What's the Mac latency? You can measure that. And then you can look at the operating system noise and then also hardware noise. There may, be, there may not be much you can do about either one of those, but understanding that would be helpful. Exa for example, hardware noise. Can you reduce that in any way? by configuring your firmware and hardware in a certain way. Um, it would be, it is useful to understand what you're looking at. And then understanding your workload. That's very important because uh, workload is how the platform, real-time behavior really is, how the platform, system, um, hardware, OS, and workload are inter interacting with each other is what makes the real time to to get your real time goals it's very important to do that so let's look at what we are doing to understand um, the workload first of all you probably have some idea on your workload that whether is it allocating um, memory and locking memory for example you don't want to any real time uh, workload um, you don't want to have um, allocation stalls meaning waiting for memory and missing your deadline type of thing. So you want to be able to allocate and lock the memory. And then you probably noticed when I ran cyclic test earlier, I had mlock option on. So I'm asking the cyclic test to uh, lock the pages. And is it, think about your workload, is it a hybrid workload with RT and non-RT uh, threads? And if you have those, are the priorities work together? for your goal of deadlines, and your deadlines and RT behavior you're looking for. And the other thing to look at is, do you have any dependencies that prevent you between RT, RT threads and non-RT threads that prevent you to achieve your deadlines and goals? Um, and then, of course, you want to run a show test, continuous hours of operation test on your workload to understand how the, your workload is behaving on a longer period of time. And, and okay, so, so now you're understanding your system, you're understanding your workload, and I have, I have given you the number of tools that can be used to do both. And now, what, what, do, what do you want to gather? You might ask, well, okay, you asked me to run all these tests, but what do you want me to do with this? So you, what you do is you record your system stats. You want to do that before your workload starts, because get a baseline. And while workload is running, maybe pick a midpoint um, or get more readings than one if you want. And then after the workload stops. And you're looking for these stats. You're looking for is your workload uh, fragmenting memory. And what are the stats, VM stats? You're looking for those stats. Um, OS pro you can look at those files. OS provides those for you. And general system health, you're looking for, am I seeing lots of interrupts? Am I seeing NMIs? And anything that I don't want to see? 
And you want to look at the scheduler stats, and then you want to look at pressure, CPU, I.O., and memory, and so on. What does the memory stats tell you? So you're looking for fragmentation, of course. And then the other thing you're looking for is, am I seeing any allocation stalls? That would indicate that your RT workload, or maybe the non-RT threads that, are, that could be interfering, and then you might be seeing, um, you don't want to see allocation stalls. That's, that's what it is. You don't want to see too many of them. And then you are looking also at um, compaction failures and how many times compact daemon, daemon is waking up. And then when you are, are you seeing when if you compact daemon isolates pages for migration, then are you seeing um, failures in that? So you're looking for all of these things. And then you're also looking at the page migration success and failure numbers. And then you're looking at NRM lock that tells you how many pages are um, locked. So what, are you, what am I, with all these stats, what are you um, paying attention to? You're paying attention to, is memory fragmented after workload run? Or am I seeing allocation stalls or compaction stalls? These are all, will tell you if your workload is behaving to be an RT workload. Because you wanna you wanna look at that, and that need that, that needs to be fixed as well. If you if 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 your workload is not an ideal or a good RT workload, so are you seeing a larger number of pre migration failures? Um, you wanna compare page migration success and failed stats to um, com compact isolated. This number of pages K compact D isolated for regression. You don't want migration. You mean I mean. You don't want to see too many failures. Page migration should be less than about, I mean, you're gonna see failures. I mean, that's a given for various reasons, but um, you want those failures to be a smaller percentage of your um, pages that are slated for migration. So let's see, we went through, yes. Um, if you are seeing more um, migrate success and and you want to see that, and if you're seeing that, that's an indication that you want to look at, look at closely. This is a good indicator that how many times a comp compact daemon wakes up. It's a counter that keeps um, um, bumped up whenever daemon wakes up. So that tells you, actually, that your compact daemon is healthy. That's what you want to see, that it is healthy and running, um, and it's not blocked by anything. Workload should lock um, memory because it should allocate memory in the initially and then lock it so that it's not taking the memory um, allocation times. It's not spending time allocating memory while the workload is during runtime. And depending on your workload size, you can estimate and see your MRM lock should be a high number depending on your workload. That that's again, depends on the workload, and you have to compare your workload. You have to know your workload and how the, your workload is interacting with your platform. So, yes, this is, an, um, this is the test I did with, um, with six kernel compiles happening in parallel and running cyclic deadline for an hour. So you, uh, you can see what I'm talking about, the page migrate failures is a smaller per percentage of uh, what ha has been isolated and success are quite high. So that's kind of what you want to see. So again, after memory, you looked at the memory stats. Also look at um, scheduler stats. Do they look okay? Do you, and then you want to see your, uh, how your, um, Workload, while you're learning the workload, are you seeing MCEs, interrupts, and et cetera? And Ilana mentioned um, that in some cases, ignoring your uh, correctable things, that form, um, firmware and hardware corrects, is a good idea so that you're, while you're running the workload, you're not trying to handle something that's been already handled or that your hardware could handle. So look at your pressure stats, CPU, IO memory, and if it's a CPU-bound workload, 
is your workload, do you understand your workload in terms of are they tracking um, the numbers you're seeing, do they tra track your workload or align with your workload and resource usage as well. And you can tweak a lot of these things with the securities coverage um, that uh, uh, file over there. You want to you wanna, you wanna be able to only handle the things you absolutely have to. Uh, thanks, Lynn. Um, so pay attention to deadline misses using deadline test we talked about. And then tune hardware and firmware as suggested by your vendor. Turning off power management MIS, MIS, NMIS, it's, you know, you want to... You want to make sure you're doing the right, taking the right action for your workload. And adjusting P states, the same thing. Um, you want to do the right thing. Um, Linux is scheduling. Uh, here you have to see that you RT throttling. Linux scheduling assumes that, the premise is that a well behaving RT workload doesn't exceed 95% of the CPU time. So that means. Um, there is a 5% strictly reserved for non-RT enforced all the time. So for example, you have a runaway RT thread. What are you going to do? You, you, a sysadmin has to have enough bandwidth to be able to go in and maybe take action. So that's where that 5% comes in. And then um, you do not need to do tune any RT throttling. Don't, don't mess with that. The, let it be. It's a soft. As you understand, Linux uh, RT is a soft real time. So, and then look at the uh, deadline scheduling class. That pro if your workload is deadline based, that's what you probably want to use. That because it ensures deadlines are met. And there is work happening in progress work now. Um, there are t deadline scheduling server. Two, um, there is a delay in enabling um, deadline server. So. We're con controlling de de so that you have, the idea is that you have this 5% um, of the time um, that we have reserved. So can we take advantage of that 5% of the time? Um, avoid idling. If you, are, if, if you are going idling, can we take the 5% of the time? So there are multiple, uh, there is two different ideas that are being talked about on how when um, deadline server could come in and schedule tasks. So I'm following that work, and I'm also using both patch sets for my testing, um, that patch test that's in discussion. OK, so I think I'm kind of on track here. Uh, Min showed five minutes warning for me. So OK, so. It, yeah, it should, should, should I go forward? OK, future, I, I think Ilana and I will come up with something. These are my references. And that's pretty much it. Um, discussion, questions? Yeah. I have the microphone here. Any questions? I'll pass the microphone to you. So in the first part of the presentation, um, you mentioned that uh, disabling some uh, lockup detectors uh, is not recommended. Uh, so maybe you could uh, repeat uh, the, the motivation. Why it is bad? Uh, lockup detectors. Oh, lockup detectors because for safety critical applications, oh, sorry. For safety critical applications, sometimes there are strict requirements that we need that kind of support, the f what the features present, but they have an, o they have a, um, an overhead oh, in the okay. execution, so you have to balance that, and, th and that's where you have to balance your requirements for real time versus safety. Okay, okay. so uh, yeah, real yeah. Uh, overhead basically. Yeah. And uh, the second point was uh, regarding this uh, hardware corrected uh, issues. For example, I have uh, ECC uh, memory and it is hardware corrected, uh, so currently we use it uh, to like uh, as an early warning that like we don't panic but uh, we log this and uh, then analyze the logs uh, because usually it starts with like correctable errors and then with the time it becomes uncorrectable so what is the motivation to disable this as well 
No, I didn't say to disable. What I'm saying is that the, the, the application layer doesn't have to handle the correctable errors which are handled by the hardware. And we are finding that for autom in autom the automotive grade hardware, more and more of the vendors are supporting correctable hardware features, which are very helpful to so that we avoid the overhead and the performance impact and, and the, the deployment implementation of, of any safety features in, in the application layer, okay, mm. the software itself. And um, I mentioned the same point with SMIs, is something only recently which we are finding, that um, we can, via the hardware, get um, um, more clues and information. In different hardware registers, there's information being tracked for us that we can much better get an, a, a, a handle and a, um, an understanding of where those um, interrupts are coming from, why they are, you know, why they are generated, how they should be handled properly, and then to understand what's left for us to do on the application layer, okay? And a lot of this work together with the hardware is something we should be aware of so that, um, let's say, each layer is doing what it needs to do best, and we don't have to do work in the application layer, which, in the software layer, okay, uh, which could be drivers or anything, you know, anything above the hardware that, um, that is much better handled by the hardware. Mm, okay, thanks. so that was the general point, and uh, there are a lot of examples, you know, which you can see, especially, you should have that awareness. It's, again, I know from automotive grade hardware, but I think it's probably true in, in general for hardware nowadays that to take advantage of hardware features which can support um, the design and the implementation. Okay? okay it means thanks. we focus on what we really need to do. Not, okay? There is a question from a virtual attendee. What is hardware uh, operating system noise? So this would go back to um, NMIs and correctable errors and then also some of the stuff, some of the hardware related noise that could make the workload miss deadlines. Any op hardware related activity that could miss, have the miss. So because when, when you have NMIS and su such happening, you go into, the firmware usually goes into, um, well, OS has to go and get information on the status of the hardware. So that's the kind of thing you're looking for, measuring hardware noise. I have the microphone here. We still have a couple of minutes. So really what we are trying to do is um, put together a um, guidebook for system integrators so that they uh, understand um, preemptality kernel and what are the things that they can look at to figure out the behavior of their workload on a system. From Alisa's perspective, we use generic workloads because we don't have, we, 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 are not, we are not looking at a specific hardware or specific firmware or any specific workload. We have a couple of workloads that we might work on, but currently we are looking at, for this purpose, we are looking at a generic workload, which is RT. So, Ilana, do you have? Yeah, I have one, one last comment. It's really an invitation to the community. Um, I work as a, you know, as a system architect, de designing software, designing these features, and it's it's a new journey for me in our work. And um, but uh, to invite people to to think of the potential and, and the challenges, in particular in safety critical systems, not to run away from it. <laughs> okay, and I'm not talking about that dedicated microcontroller which. Um, has very, very, very strict safety requirements, which almost always, it's, it's not relevant to use Linux there and it's not needed because you only have very focused features. But when you have systems, we really need um, a lot of power, a lot of um, um, features to be supported. There's strict, both real-time and safety um, requirements to understand how 
um, Linux rather than hinder us. It gives us that power and to see how we do it in the right way. Okay? So thank you. Thank you.